Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast, where we explore your hidden thoughts and desires, revealing your greatest drop the mic moments. Now, here's your host, Art Costello. Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast. Today, I am honored to have Trieste Loving as our guest. She has spent 26 years in the Navy. Trieste uses her awesome skills and talents to work with police departments and sheriff's departments, helping them with internal and external race relations. She has over 25 years of experience in race relations and diversity. Trieste provides the framework for the departments to improve teamwork, create stronger community connection, and work environments where they can thrive. Welcome to the show, Trieste. Love to have you here. We met at the New Media Summit. She is a absolutely fascinating person. And having been myself a U.S. Marine, we have a connection. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, because we do. the Marines are under the Department of the Navy. Yeah. Anyway, Trieste, welcome to the show. Glad to have you on. I'm really anxious and I want to learn a lot about diversity and racial equality from you. And can you tell us your backstory? How, how this all began for you? Sure. Well, as you said, I spent 26 years in the Navy. I loved every minute of it, even though I may have said I didn't like it on days, but it was no brainer for me to stay in as long as I did. And uh, I'm from a small town in Kentucky, so I got a big, huge culture shock myself when I went to the Navy. And there were all these different ethnicities that I had never even laid eyes on. And there they were. So I had to start working it from day one in the military. And so I started doing diversity and race relations while I was still in the Navy. I spent over half my career doing diversity and race relations. So that's where I got my experience in the Navy, which some of you would probably be shocked, but there are some serious issues along racial lines in the Navy. And I think it is in a lot of the other services too. So I learned, I honed my skills talking to racists, just talking to sailors about what is and is not acceptable behavior. And I just had a blast doing it. I had a total blast doing it. So when I retired in 2008, I said, well, I got one or two options. One, of course, I can go work for somebody else again, which I was rather tired of. Or two, I could strike out and start my own business. So that's what I've been working on for the last 10 years now, is uh, getting myself in place and getting things in place so I could start my own business. And that's how I am. And I ended up at the first New Media Summit. My first was earlier this year, and I loved it. So that's why I was glad I got to go back. Yeah, it was great to meet you there. And I was in the service, I think probably a little, well, probably a lot before you were. I went into the Marines in 1965, Mm -hmm. ended up in Vietnam. And it was my first exposure to so many diverse cultures. I grew up in upstate New York, and I grew up on a dairy farm, potato farm. Migrant workers that came out of Florida, picked the potatoes, and then went back. Some of the migrant workers stayed. And because of my growing up and how my life was, our family was kind of shunned where we were. So my best friend became David Wright who was one of, I should say, one of my best friends. And David's parents were my workers that stayed to work in the potato warehouses and stuff. And uh, David and I pretty had a lot of uh, circumstances very similar because we both lived in homes that were just absolutely dumps, had no indoor plumbing, had no indoor facilities. Uh, We had to haul water from the same spring Mm -hmm. up to our houses for water. And after I graduated, uh, David stayed there and I went in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And when I got in the Marine Corps, I had cultural shock, even though I had been around David and Mary and their family and everything. David was always a human to me. I never, never looked at color. But when I got into the service, I was subjected to a lot of men and women who would say things to people 
to their face and then say completely different things behind their back. And it was shocking for me. It was culture shock for me. Mm -hmm. And that's when I learned about racial inequality and how people really think and speak in public and in private. Mm -hmm. And do you have any thoughts on that? In the year was 1965 when I went in, in there. So racial differences were very, very different and heated because of mm -hmm. what was going on in the South versus what was going on in the North and all that. So it was very different. Was it different for you growing up? Well, since I grew up in a small town and there were the only Black people there were my family. So it was like 98% white. So I grew up as, if you will, a white girl. My friends make fun of me because I try to sound like I'm street and they just laugh. They say, you should just stop trying because you really can't do it. So what I found though, when growing up there, that it was culture shock for my other white friends who eventually became my white friends, shall I say, because they had never seen a black person. We lived in one town and they lived in different towns. So it was like, well, when we combine school, here you go, here's this person. And it's like, who is she? And what is up with your skin? And one girl asked me what color my blood was because I was black. And I'm like, well, as far as I know, it's red, just <laughs> like yours. But you know, that was an innocent question, but it just showed the signs of the times where I was. Now, I was born in 62. So we're talking about the 70s, mm -hmm. mainly the 70s and, you know, just right at 80s mm -hmm. in the 80s. So I did see a difference when I was in the Navy from traveling all over the world that, you know, there are different cultures and they will be polite, but sometimes they would say something and they didn't realize what they said. They didn't realize it was something that was, you know, taboo, if you mm -hmm. will. Something that makes someone uncomfortable. So, yes, I, I did see that when I was growing up. And I know how people are now. So, you know, being in the Navy is no different than being on the outside. I just knew what I was going to put on every day. But still had to deal with the same types of people, same types of discussions, the same types of uh, knowledge in the background. So, yes, I agree with what you said. The need to have closure in any given situation is sheer human nature. And when it comes to romantic relationships, this desire skyrockets. Has your previously failed relationship left you in immense pain? It's not uncommon for people to shy away from a new relationship after their first one fails miserably. The fear of the unknown makes them hide in a shell to prevent any future heartbreak. Relatable? Despite wanting to love and be loved, you can't take the plunge if your mind and heart are still locked somewhere in the past. Maybe you aren't aware of the power of releasing the past, or perhaps you don't know how to do it. Art Costello in his online course teaches the art of moving on from bad places to happier, more stable ones. This course can change your life for good, helping you beat all kinds of negativity on the road to eternal bliss. Sign up now before the gloominess gets the better of you at expectationacademy.com. You know, one of the things that I noticed was the difference between combat Marines and the rear echelon Marines, because the combat Marines, we lived, slept together all the time, and our lives depended on each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. And the guys in the rear, I noticed there was more division. In 1965 and six in Vietnam, the Black Marines would hang out together pretty much by themselves in the rear echelon. And then the white Marines would be together. The Spanish guys would be together and the Puerto Rican guys would all be together. It wasn't only till we got into combat that it all changed because we were, everybody has to rely on everybody. And of course, the Marine Corps is very disciplined about it. Mm -hmm. But the minute you broke away from it, boy, you'd see it come pop its ugly head up again. You know, the prejudices and you know, and there was a difference between Northern Marines and Southern Marines. And I mean, there was, right. There was a lot of diversity in thought and action and all that. But one of the things that has always bothered me 
is I'm huge about labeling because I believe that we live up to our labels. And if you have negative labels, you'll live up to them if you're told. It's like telling kids in school, you're stupid. If you tell children in school they're stupid, sooner or later, they're going to believe they are stupid. So, you know, one of the things that I have always been adverse to is having people label people. Because once you label people, they tend to live up to that label. So I was very careful always about calling people of color their <laughs> color, you know, or, you know, calling them black or anything. And I, even to this day, I don't believe it. I don't look at you that way. I don't look at other people that way. I just think that it taints us. Do you have any thoughts on that, on labeling? Yes, I do. Uh, I have thoughts on just about anything you're going to ask me today. So. <laughs> Yes, labeling. Well, I'm as guilty as anyone. Sometimes well, I think a little bit more about labeling people, labeling things. And it is only because I work with people and I know when they tell me there's something, like the racist told me that they were racist and I can tell by the way they interacted with me. I can tell by the way they talked to me. I can tell by the way they weren't looking in my eyes. They were just like, I just got to get out of this room with you because you know I don't like you because you're black. Hmm. So labels, yes, yes. I still, and I'm not going to call it labeling. I'm going to call it that I am recognizing that there is a difference because there is a difference. You know, I am black and you are white or Caucasian, however you like to be called. And so I know that, but I don't use that label as a stereotype the way some people will. And when they label something, sometimes they mean it in a derogatory sense. So you get people who label that way. And that's who the people I try to talk to. Those are those are my clients right there where they uh have something that they don't like about someone. And it is something as simple as the color of their skin, their religion, their ethnic background. And it's imperative that we all try to, when we hear something that sounds kind of off, one of the things I say, if you hear something, say something. Just like if you see something, say something. Well, I call on people Like I said, if you hear something wrong, you hear that it's off, that you could stand up and say, no, that's not right. You shouldn't have said it. Or if you were going to say it, you should have said it like this or whatever. Not right. And it depends on if I do that. And I have done that. And it depends on where I am if I say it in front of a group of people like they did or if I can pull them over to the side and mention it. I try to pull them over to the side, though. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. So, yes, labels, they do have their place, at least in my world, but it's not the label to put the stereotype on someone to say, oh, because you're black, you're lazy, you know, and it's like, no, I just happen to be a black female and how I am is beyond what my skin color looks like. So it's interesting labels. You have to be careful. I'm definitely careful when I start talking to people who don't look like me and try not to label them too much, but just get to know them. You know, all you have to do is to ask one question to someone that you don't know or someone who doesn't look like you to start a conversation. And it's everyday questions like, what's your favorite color? Something just that simple will help break the ice when people feel like, well, I'm not going to talk to them because I don't want to hear what they have to say, or it's probably not the truth way. But when you're talking about what's your favorite color, you know, only you know what the truth is there. And it's just a way to start a simple yet powerful conversation. Am I hearing you right if I was to say that one of the ways that we can get racial diversity and inclusion is by just starting the conversation? and realizing that the person is human, just like we all are. Exactly. Yep. That's the way. And that's what I use in my training myself is I call it immersion. Mm -hmm. So I tell them to immerse themselves on their off duty, talking about police officers and sheriffs. Right. When they're not at work and start talking to people who don't look like you. 
I mean, it's just that simple. And you can start off with such a innocent question. It's like, it's a nice day, isn't it? And somebody can say, yeah. And it's like, we haven't had these. And then you just start talking. But you see in front of you actually kind of bleeds off. You can't tell that I'm black or you're white. That's not the most important thing anymore. The most important thing is we have this conversation and you really want to talk to somebody. And that's pretty much how I operate with everybody, because I just start conversations. It could be about really anything. And then once I start the conversation, it just then I delve into and, and sometimes people say to me, it's none of your business. But but most right. of the time people will open up and tell you about what they're doing. I mean, just even on the show, I mean, we we open it with tell me your story. You know, I want to hear your story because I think people's stories create that human element of compassion and love. Because once we start listening to people's stories, we learn how much we are alike Mm -hmm. and how little difference there is in it. We all hurt. We all love. We all care. We've all been through experiences, different experiences, but yet none of our experiences are the same. I can't tell you how you feel because I'm not you. I don't know you. I have not experienced life as you have. You can't tell me about me. All you can do is empathize with me when I tell you my story and how I grew up, and then you empathize with me, and then we bond. We have that bond that gets there. And that's the thing with me is that most people don't reach out to other people, even when they're the same race. I mean, people can sit on a bus next to each other, be the same race, and never say a word to each other. But it's that stepping out and telling a little bit about yourself so somebody feels comfortable around you. And I think it's really important. And how does that work into, and I know you work with all these sheriff's departments and all that. I've been around law enforcement. My my best friend's a Texas uh, DPS officer, Mm -hmm. Department of Public Safety. And him and I have been close for 30 years. And I've ridden with him. And I know some of the things that he has gone through out on the street. And Just like in the real world, there's policemen that are very quiet and you could work with them for 15 years and never know how many kids they had or, you know, what was going on. How does it work for you to get into that environment with such so many diverse points of view and all that? Is that a crazy question? (laughs) No, it's not crazy at all. It makes sense. I want to backtrack a little bit before I answer it and what you said. Yes. People of the same race sometimes have problems talking to someone else. It's not ingrained in a lot of people. Like when you're down, well, I call Kentucky the South, but only sometimes. Mm -hmm. When I grew up down in the South, we automatically, when I saw another Black person, I would automatically talk to them because they were actually different than the people around me. So I was actually trying to understand from a Black perspective, how my life is and how my lenses were rather filtered. So I just wanted to bring that point up because you were absolutely correct with sometimes the same race, they don't reach out and talk to each other. And for the second part of that is when I'm dealing with police officers or sheriff's deputies, I try to keep in mind what what they're there to do, which is serve and protect. And the way I approach it is always to help them serve better or protect more. And sometimes it can be challenging. And a lot of that goes back to socialization, which I'll cover in a bit. Mm -hmm. But it can be challenging because of their status in a community, right? You know, they're there, like I said, to serve and protect. They're there to keep the uh, law in order. So. It can be difficult with some people, but it would be difficult with them whether they had the uniform on or not. There are just some people who just don't want to get along with anybody. And what I try to do is to help them come back off of some of the stereotypes they have, because if they're not talking to somebody who doesn't look like them, then the only thing they have to go by is stereotypes, what someone told them that these kind of people are, or those kind of people are. Mm -hmm. So I try to get them not to automatically default to their stereotype. 
to where when I do the training and I immerse them and I ask them to immerse themselves in a whole different culture, then that can knock down some of the stereotypes they have. And then what they'll be doing is when they see somebody who doesn't look like them, it's not a first negative thought. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, um, I was talking to A, B, C, D, E. Now, this is all going in nanoseconds in their brain, right? Mm -hmm. But it's giving them a better fallback on instead of just letting them go with their stereotypes and try to help them when they're at work, try to immerse themselves because it's not always conducive to that. But I like, like I said, I like to get them when they're off work, they're comfortable, they're where they want to be, and then just have the conversation. So it's, it can be tricky sometimes with them. Has anyone ever inspired you to discover a happier, healthier, and more fulfilled you? It is a magical experience, isn't it? Inspiration is indeed very powerful, yet it's often undermined. It can lift you from the ground to the sky in no time. Have you ever thought about returning the favor by inspiring the people around you? If you don't think you have it in you, we have good news for you. Art Costello's online course has everything you need to learn to supercharge yourself and shape your character into a powerful personality. Get ready to discover your strengths and unleash the creativity within. Don't believe it? Check it out yourself by signing up for this life-changing course at expectationacademy.com. That's expectationacademy.com. One of the things for me that I understand, because I come from the perspective of having ridden with a police officer on patrol many times, I know one of the things that police officers right now are working under is extreme fear. They fear for their life. They want to go home. Mm -hmm. And we just had an incident this Saturday night in Fort Worth, which is 300 miles from us, where a man, a deputy shot through a window, never said a word or asked anything because I'm sure he feared for his life and killed a young lady, 28 years old. And it's going to turn into another thing like the Dallas police shooting in the apartments. And how do we get police officers and the public to where the fear isn't so great from the police officers and the fear isn't so great from the the Black community or the Hispanic community, the minority communities? Because I think it's all minority communities have this fear of policemen, you know? Yes. And how do we immerse them too into conversation where this can stop? Does that start with How does it start? Does it start with the police officers first going into the communities and getting knowing their environment? That's one way. Yes, that is one way for sure. And uh, I talk a lot about community involvement and police and sheriffs. So the way that and I understand fear is usually the thing that we call it, but it's not like we're necessarily fearful of the person. We're fearful of what we think that person is. And that goes back to falling on stereotypes and Mm -hmm. relying on those to say, hey, well, I know all white people are ABC. So when I see a white person, I'm probably not going to want to talk to them on and on. And it starts with somebody who can tell the story like I tell my story so they can understand me in the town I grew up in. And then... I'll ask them about their story. And people love to talk about themselves. You know, <laughs> once you give them a few minutes and they're gone. So it's really not that hard to get the conversation flowing. It's just not being fearful of what you don't know about them. What is it about them that makes them or makes a group fearful of another group? And I go back to it's just how they were socialized. And uh, I'll go ahead and cover a little bit of socialization now because I think it's a good spot. Uh, Socialization is what we all go through and it comes to who we are. It makes us who we are. And socialization is passed down from generation to generation, the things like language or values or beliefs or truths, religion. So those types of things we learn 
Some of it we learn and we don't know we're learning it. We see other people's actions and particularly our parents. Our parents are the ones who really give us that first look at looking at somebody else and then your parents telling you what they know about that group of people, which may or may not be true. It was what was passed down to them from their parents. So I don't ever say somebody's parents raised you wrong because that's not that's not in me to say that. What I can say, though, is your parents socialized you a little bit differently than somebody else who looks like you. And those other people don't have a problem with somebody who's a different color. But because of the way your parents passed it down to you, then you may have a problem with people of different colors. And I want to tell a real quick story to show that this is real. And this is what happened to me with one of my conversations with a racist on board. He had been on board the ship hours. I mean, literally hours, not days, not weeks. But this young man got to the ship and within hours, he had started an uproar because he said that he couldn't work the N-word. He couldn't work them. And it was like, well, that's just not going to function, right? And he worked on the flight deck. So, you know, that's like a orchestra that itself, you know, everybody knows their place. They know where they're supposed to be at a certain time. And you can't have somebody on the flight deck saying that they're not going to work for somebody, but for sure they're not going to work for somebody who is Black. So they sent him down to talk to me. And uh, his supervisor and his supervisor called to let me know he was coming down. About two or three minutes later, all of a sudden, the door to my office slams open. And here's this 18-year-old white kid saying, I can't work for the N-word. And I'm like, well, so you're who I was, you're who I'm supposed to be talking to. And so I made him go back outside and come in the come in like a normal person would come in someone else's office. And then we got started. And it's like, I know you probably don't want to, you don't want to hear anything from me because I'm black. But let me tell you, this is my job. And I start conversation with where are you from? What made you want to come in the Navy? What made you pick the job that you pick? Again, letting them feel comfortable talking about themselves first. Instead of me saying, oh, you're wrong. You can't say that, and you just need to get yourself together and get back up there to go to work. That's not how I operated with any of them. I sat down like three and a half hours with this kid, and we finally got to the point to where he would come see me first if he thought he was being mistreated by anybody, no matter what color, he'd come down to see me. So I was his ally. And I called him, I told him, it's like, well, look at you now. Now, the first day we know what we both know what you said. And I said, look at you now. You're coming down here to me, a black person for help. And it's like, did you ever think that that would happen? And he looked up and he gave me the honest answer and said, no. He says, I, I never would have thought that would happen. You know, that would have never been my first choice would be to come talk to you about anything. But he grew up in a small town in Texas and there were only white people in his town. So the only thing he knew about somebody who didn't look like him is what his parents and grandparents, other family members told him, what his friends told him, what the teachers might be saying in class. So he's picking up on all this stuff. He's getting socialized, like bombarded with information, but he didn't have any firsthand information. And that's what I tried to do. Give him firsthand. This is this is how a black person can be for you. And if you work right and if you work hard, then you're not going to have any problems with any color supervisor. It's like that's on you to work hard and to be a part of the team. And I got him to about a month and then he just fell back into his same old ways. And we had to discharge him because of his views and his language. But that was just, you know, he was an 18 year old kid. He'd never been anywhere. And he relied on his socialization as he should from his parents, grandparents, school, et cetera. He relied on that to help him navigate the world. And then I come in and I totally throw his world off kilter. Now he's like, wow, now I'm, I'm somebody who doesn't look like me for help. And 
I used to think that they were lazy. I used to think they started fights all the time. I used to think that if there were drugs to be had on the ship, they were going to have them. And all these things started falling away the more we talked. And we talked, oh my gosh, that child was in my office five, six times a day thinking somebody has done him wrong and he wants me to make sure they haven't done him wrong. And so it was. It got to be pretty funny. It was a shame that he couldn't change because he was a good worker. He would have gone far in the Navy, but he just couldn't get past how he was socialized. Yeah, and it's a wonder that he even lasted that long in the Navy. I mean, you know, because the Navy and the Marine Corps are very diverse. And I mean, it's usually picked up very early on. And mm-hmm. he must have hidden it in the boot camp and that, that kind of thing to get on ship to do that. Yeah. But But, you know, we're dealing with a a lot of white supremacist and racism in this country right now. And I think about it and, you know, for me, it disgusts me and all that. And I would to have that view any time that you limit what somebody else can teach you, you're really cutting yourself short. And, you know, for me, I want to learn as much as I can. I mean, I'm 72 years old now, and and I still want to learn about people. I love people so much. That's why I love talking to people, because I learn from their experience, and I incorporate it into my life. How do we get to these hardcore? Do you think we ever will get to these hardcore white supremacists? No, I know. And for the very thing I just said, They get socialized by their parents. And then before you know it, they're in this group of people. And they went to this group of people. Not It may not have been because they thought that they would think like they do or they seem to act just like them. They get to that group of people like we do any other thing. It's like they are looking for something that's missing in their life. And... They know that all of a sudden this white supremacist group has what they're looking for. They have friends. They can go camping together if they like to camp. They can go shooting together. They can do all these things together and then they get immediately accepted into this group. Now, a lot of people, I've talked to a lot of people who were white supremacists. I asked them the same very question. It's like, well, do you think we could ever stop this? And they answered the question like I did. It's a nice dream to have. And can we get better? Oh, heck yeah. We can definitely get better. And it's the same steps that I do with police officers and sheriff's deputies. I do with people who are racist. I sit them down and I tell them, you need to go find people who treat you right, and you'll see it doesn't matter what color you are. And then that will hopefully start having them overturn a few things in their mind, have them overturn that blacks are all lazy and, you know, they all sell drugs. And it's the same thing with somebody who, if they omit, one, that they are a hardcore racist, and two, if they're a hardcore racist, how comfortable was I, and I'll use myself, how comfortable was I to sit there and talk to somebody who I know they just didn't look like me because of the way I look. So uh, no, because we go through socialization. And as that one 18 year old I was talking about, 18 years old, and that was, oh goodness, seven, eight years ago that this happened. But he was 18 and already he had such a hatred for black people. At 18. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so he wasn't born with the thought that black people are lazy. He was told black people were lazy. Yeah. So, and what the media does, it's unfortunate. There are two things I don't like about the media. One is that it's a 24 hour news cycle now. So, you know, everything gets picked up and some things get looked over that I think would be better. And two, the media can sometimes pigeonhole different races and ethnicities into what they think they are. So when they're going, they want to make a TV show and they want somebody who's going to be a housekeeper. Well, they could either go to a black person or they could go to the Hispanic person, but they really wouldn't think about the white person being someone who cleans up 
after themselves because that's not how they were told white people are. They're not like that. Mm -hmm. You know, this type of job is for this person and they do it in TV shows, they do it in the movies and there's nothing wrong with that as long as it's a good stereotype and at the end of that, that there's something positive and not just that, you know, you're going off of what you were told and what you were told may be a little off. So no, once again, I say no, it's not going to go away, but we can make it better, but people have to step out and stand up to make it better. It's not going to do it on its own, that's for sure. Don't know which direction you want your life to take? Are you sinking deep down into the pit of uncertainties day by day? So, what's the secret to leading a happy, satisfied life? It's taking matters into your own hands. But what if the matters in question are a total blur? Art Costello's Expectation Academy course aims to tell you exactly how you can get some clarity in your life. This course can be your savior on your journey to reinventing yourself. While you certainly can't plan your whole future ahead, you can definitely control twists and turns your life takes. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for this course now at expectationacademy.com. Get a chance to broaden your horizons and add meaning to your life. That's expectationacademy.com. When you were talking, one of the things that was going through my mind is what I call economic racism, where we don't give people of color the chance to progress in jobs. And very similar to what you said, we subrogate to cleaning and, and lawn services and, you know, service jobs that white people don't want to do. How do we start? I mean, I know it's through education. I mean, partly. But when you go into the inner cities and you see how suppressed so many black youth have come, you know, we talk about stopping the drug culture in this country. Well, when your family's starving and you don't have anything else to do and you've got it, you know, that's why the drug lords prey on our economically disadvantaged. And I'm going to ask you, how do we, how do we change the economic racism that exists? How, how do we even start? Well, one thing is to Back off some stereotypes, and I keep talking about stereotypes, but we all have them. That drives us a lot during our day, depending on who we meet up with. So it's uh, debunking some stereotypes, but also it's to help, to me, speaking for myself, the way that it's going to change in a city where the only thing they have to choose from is either don't eat food or go out and sell some drugs to somebody so you can have money to eat. Understand that those are two very hard choices and they're at the opposite ends of the spectrum. So to help somebody who you can clearly see is disadvantaged just because of the way they look, but no one has given them the chance to talk about themselves, talk about the things that they see going on, and maybe they have the remedy themselves and they can come up with it, but that's not how we go about talking to them like that. We talk down to them. We talk down about how they are. And I, I try to make it a point when I am in a hotel or in a restaurant, I try to make it a point to thank, particularly people who clean the hotels, I thank them at least two or three times that I'm there staying. I said, you're doing a really good job and I really appreciate what you're doing. And that makes, you know, those people start smiling and it's like somebody noticed me for me just being, you know, the housekeeper. So we have to start doing more of that as well. We need to start building people up instead of tearing them down. You know. You, you brought up a good point. You know why? When I had never, and I've traveled extensively in my business and everything else. And when I married my wife, my current wife, I lost my other wife to cancer. But, and when I remarried, my wife taught me to leave a tip on the bed for the wait staff, or for the cleaning staff. And she would always write this beautiful note about how well they kept the room and everything. 
And that taught me, I started doing that. And it, it isn't only for them, but it's also for you because you learn to appreciate what mm-hmm. they do. And, you know, when we were at New Media Summit, we were staying at the hotel and I did that and I walked out and the lady that was cleaning our floor, she came up to me and she said, you don't know how much that means to me. And she said, for me, it was the difference between baby formula and diapers Mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how I was going to pay for it. And I just thought, I said, that is so impactful to hear her say that. Because my next thought was, what if everybody on this floor had done that for her? Yeah, right. Imagine what it would have done for her life, you know, change it immensely. Absolutely. So. And and I'm glad your wife talks you into doing that. That's a <laughs> she didn't nice have to talk me much into <laughs> it. <laughs> to bring it to your forefront then. Something that yeah, you, knew, there you, you go. probably do, but it just was back in your uh, unconscious mind. I just had never thought of it before. Yeah. You know. I, I tried to do it, even, even the people who were bringing us water at the New Media Summit, you know, they come in, they get us <laughs> cold water. And if I caught one of them, I'd tell them, thank you for what you do because you're making this possible. And you're right. They feel so much different about what they're doing. So now it's like I can take pride in my service for real because somebody has acknowledged that I do a good job and I'm going to keep doing that, keep doing that good job and thinking that maybe somebody else will tell me that I'm doing a good job. Uh, if I put like 110% into this. So Mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, just that one simple gesture can help people so they don't see them as this is their job, if you will. Of course, it's their job, but, you know, it's like that's what they were put on this earth for, was to come clean up hotel rooms. And that's the only thing they can do, which is so far from the truth. But it, it takes some people looking inside themselves, too, to make that change in their thinking, in their stereotypes. And changing stereotypes are difficult because they are so ingrained, but it's not impossible for someone to change their stereotypes and start to recognize the beauty everyone adds to the world. I've always felt that leadership at any level, whether it be government, religious, social, you know, educational, whatever, leadership is always important in in changing how cultures operate and where you know right now in this country we're probably more divisive than we have ever been because of what is going on mm-hmm. you know in the government mm-hmm. and in the presidency and the senate and all that stuff but it's really i think hurt in a different way it's hurt the movement to be inclusive because what it's taken the focus away from really what's important and putting it on issues that really are, that really don't matter. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts on that? Any? <laughs> well, I think you're, I do agree with you that we are just way too divisive right now. And it's, it's unfortunate that you can see it. And I meant to talk about this. This is one thing I meant to bring up when you said something. Let me go back to that when you were saying that all the Puerto Ricans sit together, all the blacks sit together, all the whites sit together in different places. But that's called self-segregation. And all it takes is one person from a different group to go sit at that table for people to say, hey, why do we all just sit here by ourselves like this? Why do we huddle in a group? When we all should be, well, we all have to work together. When we're on the ship, we had no choice. We had to work with each other. And the self-segregation I brought up quite a few times. And I did CCTV on the ship. So I would either be a roaming reporter talking about race and ethnicity, or I would be on a set with our CO, our XO, and our CMC, Command Master Chief. Mm -hmm. And we'd be talking and they would want me to say something. So I'm not going to say that I changed it any, but people came up to thank me for that very thing for me saying, why don't you just go over there and sit with somebody who doesn't look like you? 
it's lunch. You can freely talk. Or if they don't feel like talking, oh, well, at least that, that person sees that. Oh, so I'm not thought of as that different, you know, because somebody else from another table came over to sit with me during my chow time, meal time. I'm still talking Navy. <laughs> So I hope that answered your question. I, I got all navy on myself. <laughs> no That's all right. After 26 years, you, you have the right to be all navy. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually was thinking, you know, back to my Marine Corps days, how I don't want to use the word difficult, how challenging it must have been for you because the military is so structured into classes and I'm not talking about racial classes. I'm talking about military rank. You know, the officers can't talk or socialize mm -hmm. with the enlisted and the, mm -hmm. the warrant officers. And, yeah, I mean, there's just a whole whole structure that they built, you know, that structure and that discipline mm -hmm. intact. You know, I worked in the brig in 32nd Street. When I came back from Vietnam, I went to Paris Island, South Carolina as a coach on the rifle range. And then was transferred to San Diego to 32nd Street, where we got the prisoners off of the ships from the Westpac, which were Vietnam. They were Marines, Navy prisoners that were all either going to Portsmouth or Leavenworth to serve out their sentences mm -hmm. long term, because most of them were really bad. But the first job I had was as dorm supervisor. And one of the things that we had the hardest problem with was, is that everybody would self-segregate. And it was extremely difficult to overcome that. When you force somebody into something, do you think it is as effective as if they just do it on their own? Or do you have any thoughts on that? No, I don't think it's as effective as if they do it on their own. That's why I would mention it as I was walking around the ship or whatever I was doing, because I was the person who, when I first got to the ship and everybody self-segregated, I put myself at every table, every meal. I was at a different table and I would ask them the question. So why do all you guys hang out together? Why do you eat chow together? And you know, you don't have to work with us and sleep with us. So why is it that you uh, segregate yourself like that? And it went from, didn't really think about it to, yeah, I tried, but it didn't work out. So I'm not going to try it again. And it was something that I didn't force on anybody on the ship, but I highly suggested it. And they decided to do it on their own because I, I could make them go sit at a different table. You know, like you said, I, I could have in the pure sense of what my rank was, I could have told them that. But, you know, mm -hmm. come on, that's just crazy. I'd like to see people yeah. do things on their own with their own thought process behind it. Yeah. And I guess my thoughts behind it were is that, you know, we try, we try as a society to dictate racial equality and all that when really it, this is a personal choice. Mm -hmm. This is personal behavior and taking responsibility for your behavior and creating the environment of inclusivity to everybody, mm -hmm. it becomes part of your thought process. I think I had it way, way before I ever got into the Marine Corps about being inclusive with people. But, you know, I keep going back to the thing. I always, I guess I try to be Mr. Fix-It, you know, how, how can we fix all this stuff? <laughs> you know, because it's so much easier and less stressful to get along than it is to put all your energy into being ugly, nasty, because it's negative. And anytime you deal in negatives, you're just taking away what is good in the world. And I guess that's my statement. I just want us to all be good. Was it Rodney King that said, why can't we all just get yeah. to get, be, you know, be together? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the question I think a lot of us ask every day. Why can't we? Right. Yeah. And as you said, it's a personal choice. And sometimes people don't even look at it as though it's a personal choice. It's like, well, I'm just going to go with the flow of the crowd. And the flow of the crowd happens to be going this way. But if I turn around and go this way, I might find something even better. But I'm not going to do it because that would take too much. You know, that would take 
a lot of bravery, a lot of looking at yourself to say, hey, you know that this isn't right. Takes a lot for somebody to come out and speak up against it. And mm-hmm. because I didn't mind coming out and speaking up against it, some of my bosses hoped that I would stop talking, but <laughs> it was just something because of when I was socialized, because I was socialized with a whole different ethnic group than I was. So I learned things through a Caucasian filter, didn't know anything about black mm-hmm. culture. But I knew I had to start reaching out because I am black and it would be nice to have people in, of my own ethnic group so I could talk about things that are unique to that group. But since I was socialized not with them then, and I was socialized with Caucasians, then I felt so much more comfortable talking to a Caucasian. Uh, I felt comfortable when there was a disagreement between me and a Caucasian person. Because now we're just dealing on pure people level. We're not dealing on some hierarchy. We're not worried about somebody making somebody else look good and then they're looking bad. It's really about learning about each other. And so there has to be a willing participant to do this. And like you said, because you can't force it. I couldn't force half that stuff on the kids that I did. But I talked about it through a different lens for them to show them this, like, well, there's nothing wrong with doing it. Change it up. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And if your friends don't want to take your lead, then don't worry about it. You know, you be the best person you can be. And if that means that you might have to alienate some of your old friends because you're making new friends, that's okay because you'll, you'll come out better in the end. Another thought I just had, I always get these thoughts when I'm talking to people, (laughs) but I just had this other thought. Maybe, Maybe one of the things that we need to really, I'm big on emotional intelligence, because if you can identify your emotions, you're way ahead of the game. You can control them. You can have a different perspective on them and all kinds of things when you become emotionally intelligent. Maybe that's what we need to do is start making people more emotionally intelligent so they can better examine their, their perspectives, their motives, their all their assets that they have as human beings, maybe that's an answer to it. I mean, because honestly, let's get to real crux of everything. Racism is across all races. I mean, there are white people that are racist. There are black people that are racist. There are Puerto Ricans and Hispanics that are racist. I mean, some of the worst racism I ever saw in my life was between Hispanics and black people. Mm that they were so threatened by the blacks coming in to take the Hispanic jobs away from them that I just, I stepped back and I said, whoa, this is really odd. So, you know, but maybe it's emotional intelligence that'll change the world. I don't know. It could help. It could help. And, you know, more organizations, businesses, they're tuning up on their emotional intelligence training. Yeah. So it definitely has a, if there's a plus for it, but the only problem with trying to do a big thing that's right by doing a little bitty thing that's right, it, that's right, is because the big thing that we want to do, usually we definitely need a lot of help from somebody else. And we don't want to ask somebody to help us or we don't want to look like, oh, now I look like a fool because I just asked this question and I should have known this is where that was going to go. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it really is. I love emotional intelligence myself. I've really gotten into looking at that and it's helped me doing this job. So Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, well, I just need to leave that alone or, well, maybe we should talk about that. And uh, mm-hmm. keep myself in check. And I'm not so up in arms like, I can't believe you said that. And, <laughs> you know, going, uh, you know, ballistic on somebody just because they were asking a question. Mm-hmm. Well, I can't believe that we've spent this hour. It has gone so fast. <laughs> yes, it incredibly did. Incredibly fast. And I wanted to give the audience the opportunity to learn where they can get a hold of you and what you're doing next, and leave us with some parting thoughts. Okay. You can find me on my website. It's www.tiredofhate.com. 
you can email me at Trust Stay Loving, and I'll spell my first name, T-R-E-S-T-E-L-O-V-I-N-G at tiredofhate.com. So either way, because there's a thing on there that you could, if you're more interested in hearing more, you just put your name and email address and I'll get it and I can touch base with you because I don't mind doing that. I actually enjoy doing that. And my final thought is this, and I've learned this. I learned it when I was in the Navy teaching leadership classes. And it it doesn't matter where you are, what, what you're doing, it hits home. And that is, we must remember that right is right, even if no one agrees, and wrong is wrong, even if everyone agrees. So if you can put yourself in that sentence and say, I'm going to go do this because it's the right thing to do, and even if nobody else comes with me, I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do then you'll find that you're at peace with yourself because you know the difference between right and wrong. The only thing that you have to do is step out into it. So that's my parting words. That is beautiful because it fits right in with all the things that I talk about with expectations because at the center of it is our integrity. Trieste, thank you for being on the show. I can't thank you enough. This has been enlightening and educational. And I hope that each one of us can go out and change, do our part in changing this world and making a better place. Everybody, you know where you can get a hold of me, art at expectationtherapy.com or expectationtherapy.com is my website. Go out and make a difference in the world. We all owe it to ourselves to leave this place better. Thank you, audience. And Heather White, go ahead and take us out of here. Thanks for listening to the show. Drop us your comments and questions with what you want answered on the show. You can subscribe on iTunes and Binge Network. You can also get more information on the website, expectationtherapy.com.